we're back. Let's pray. So, Father, I thank you so much <clears throat> for this Bible study. I ask you to bless those who come in. I ask you to guide us through your truth. And I ask you to catch us up. It's been a couple of weeks. So I ask you to be with us right now. And I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Waiting for some people to show up. <clears throat> we are in James chapter 2. Hey, Joe. It's good to see you. Thanks for coming. Uh, let me get my Bible program rocking and rolling. Which I should have had up already. Um, anyway, we're in James 2 and verse 15 and 16. And I'm feeling pretty good. I'm feeling pretty good. Thanks for asking. How are you feeling? All right, Bible program finally caught up. All right, James 2. Uh, and so it says in James uh, 2.14, it says, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? And then we saw in 15 and 16, if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give him the things which are needed for the body. What does this profit? Last time we talked about how, how um, often we will say stuff like that. We'll say, uh, I'll pray for you, and, and we might never do it. Um, to answer James' question, what does it profit? It doesn't accomplish anything positive. Now, it does accomplish something for the devil because it puts into the person in need the true sensation that they don't matter to whoever it is that treated them that way. What we need to always keep in mind is that as ambassadors for Christ, and we get that from 2 Corinthians 5.20, as ambassadors for Christ, hey Lynn, um, we represent the king. That's what an ambassador does. How we respond when a person humbly tells us their need will either be how Jesus would respond or it won't be how Jesus would respond. Now there will be times when the Lord will direct us to not respond. But for the most part, it seems that he will meet the need. When we don't do anything about it, the devil is always ready to step up and tell a person that God doesn't care about him or tempt them to go try to meet their need in the flesh. My point is that meeting physical needs is very important. We know Jesus did it here in Matthew 14, 13 to 16. I'm going to... I'm trying to remember to do this on a regular basis. Paste this in the room so that you can read along. Where are we? Here we are. And he, Jesus, departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the multitudes heard it, when they found out he was there, they followed him on foot from the cities. And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude and he was moved with compassion for them. And he healed their sick. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a deserted place. And the hour is already late. Send the multitudes away so they could go into the villages and buy themselves food. But Jesus said to them, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. Hey, Gary. So that's Matthew 14, 13 through 16. In this short passage, the compassion, and we saw earlier that compassion and mercy meant basically the same thing. In this short passage, the compassion, the mercy of Jesus brings action. He heals people, meeting their need for physical healing. And he feeds them meeting their need 
for physical hunger. Now remember, this is our king. We're ambassadors for his kingdom. We serve him. And while he was on the earth, Jesus was modeling our future lifestyle as Christians just by being Jesus walking around on the earth. Hey, hey, Michael Newman. Hey, Stacy and Keith Rogers. It's good to see you. So Jesus was walking around being Jesus, modeling our future lifestyles as Christians. So in James 2, 15 and 16, James writes, If a brother or sister is naked, or in the south, naked, and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? When I was a um, fairly new Christian, I was a deacon in a church that had deacons and elders. And as a deacon, I was given an area to watch over. <clears throat> and my area was body life. There was another guy who was a deacon of encouragement. <laughs> so we each had to give a little talk on a um, men's breakfast one day um, about how we went about doing what we did. And I had this you know, this whole plan on how we can enhance um, the life of this subset of Christianity that I belong to. And this guy got up there. I'll never forget it. You know, the guy looked like a Viking. And, and this was his input as a deacon of encouragement. Be encouraged. Then he went and sat down. There was, there was absolutely no teaching on what encouragement meant. He didn't ask if anybody needed encouragement. There was no prayer for anybody. There was no hints on how you could be encouraged if you happen to be, what, discouraged. Um, he just said, be encouraged. Depart in peace. Be warm and be filled. And he did nothing to meet the needs. And I just remember sitting there going, what, what the heck is happening? If we're going to re represent the king, if we're going to represent Jesus, we will be looking for and gravitating toward human need. I believe that with all my heart. Frankly, I was talking to a guy yesterday. We were at a, a dance recital, and we were between shows. And our granddaughter's dance, and um, so we were there watching him do this. And this guy I know from, from a different uh, arena in my life calls me up. And uh, he asked me a question about some of the things that I do. And I started telling him a little bit about what I do. And he goes, well, how many people do you know? You know, and, 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 and the fact is that I have, I have an area of influence that everybody else does. And I guess my net's kind of big because it actually includes the net, the Internet. But, but um, so I know people all around the world, all over Texas, all over the United States. Um, but the main thing... Isn't, isn't how many people I know or how many people know me is that the Holy Spirit of God is perfectly capable of deputizing any of us to go meet a need, to tell us where the need is or to put it on someone's heart to just blurp it out, to just blurt it out to us what they might, could need. And then he's perfectly capable of dropping the grace in our hearts to, to accomplish what he would have us accomplish. In other words, doing the work of Christ, you don't have to have a big membership list, even though some of us do. Um, it has to do with awareness. It has to do with awareness of needs. It has to do with the heart for being like Christ in this day and age. And you know, as people complain about governments, all of, hey Liz, good to see you. There's people complain about governments and what they do and what they don't do. And what I see is that every failure of the government to take care of people makes needs more readily available for you and I to address if possible. At the very least, to sit with somebody, to pray with them, to share some of what we have. And so if we're going to represent Christ, we will be looking for and gravitating toward human need. And the Lord knows there's plenty of it. Frankly, I believe that Jesus longs for us to regain what was lost in the fall of man. He made us perfect. And all the lack 
and unmet need and disease and maladies are constant reminders to him of what we had and what we lost in the garden thanks to Adam. When Jesus is in the presence of unmet needs, he is drawn to that. And since he dwells in every Christian's human spirit, by way of the Holy Spirit, through the Holy Spirit, we truly represent him when we are drawn to human needs as well. When we are drawn to human needs, we should do what he did. Ask if we should address the need. That's what he did with his father. And if we get a yes, we should set aside what we think we need and address that other person's need instead of our own. Simple as that. You know, Christianity stuff isn't all that complicated. It's presented as a complicated formula for people who need it to be complicated so that they could feel superior to other people. It's really pretty simple. Be in contact with the Father. Be in interaction with Him through the Holy Spirit. Do what He says to do. Don't add or take away from that. How hard can it be? It's as simple as that. So in Acts, uh, I'm sorry, in, in James 15, 2, 15 and 16, He said, If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to him, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give him the things of which you are needed for the body, what does it profit? Well, it profits nothing. James 2.17 goes on to say this, Thus, also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Faith without works is dead. The King James Version has two other words in it, which, are, which emphasize that faith without works is missing something. In James 2.17 in King James it says this, Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead. Being alone. Those are the other two words. Now the term being alone highlights the truth that our faith was intended by God to be paired with action, which stems from that faith and that trust in the Lord. When works are absent in our lives, that faith is alone, if you will, dangling out there like a useless appendage. Faith is a great thing to have, but James points out that if it isn't paired with works, which literally means toil, it's dead. And the Greek word for dead is the word in the Greek for corpse. Faith without works is like a corpse. In other words, if I have trust that Jesus is the Savior and, the, and Redeemer, but I never consider that he might want to rescue others through me, that faith that I have is dead and has no power in my life. It's not going to affect anybody else, and frankly, it's going to take a toll on me. It's going to serve death into my own soul. What a tragic waste considering we're ambassadors for Christ and we're intended by God to usher the rule of God into the earth from the heavens. James 2.18 goes on. But someone will say, so he's doing a hypothetical, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. Now when we read this, some might think of a verse that Paul wrote thinking these two teach different things. And remember that people who dispute the Bible look for stuff like this. Look for issues like these to try to say the Bible is not the perfect word of God. They look for apparent um, mistakes in the scriptures. In Romans 3.23, Paul wrote this. He said, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith 
apart from the deeds of the law. So which is it? Do works make us right in the eyes of God or not? Well, the truth is that faith in Christ indeed does make us right in God's eyes. That's not the point James is making. Back in Romans 3.23, Paul was addressing the legalism of the world and Judaism under the law. Doing things does not earn us points in God's eyes. That's what Romans uh, 3.23 was about. James is saying that since we are justified in Christ, true faith is productive in terms of acting out that justification. God's intention is that we live this way because it typifies Christ in us and through us. But some of them will say, you have faith and I have works. And James says, show me your faith without your works. I will show you my faith by my works. To this day, there are Christians who claim they want to serve, but when given tasks which seem to be done, which need to be done, but which they deem to be beneath them, they will try to say that having faith alone is enough. And that's what James is saying when he gives this example, you have faith and, um, and I have works. People will think or say things like this to try to justify the absence of Christian works in their lives. They'll basically say, yeah, well, you get the works. I just have the faith. Together we put that together. And my faith and your works come together and accomplish something. Listen to a quote from the uh, Life Application Bible Study Notes. And I'm going um, to paste this in the room so that we can read it together. To get, I, I really do a lot of research to do these studies. And so I, I have lots of materials that I go through. Every now and then I find something I really think enhances this Bible study. So, so I put it in there. Um, while it is true, this is the Life Application Study Bible Notes. If you have a version, if you have the Life Application Study Bible, it's, it's probably in there. Um, while it is true that our good deeds can never earn salvation, true faith always results in a change to life, a changed life, and good deeds. Paul speaks against those who try to be saved through their deeds or by their deeds instead of true faith. James speaks against those who confuse mere intellectual assent with true faith. You know, there's a lot, one of the things that's happened in, in the body of Christ as we've mechanized it and um, squeezed a lot of the life out of it is that the Holy Spirit doesn't get a chance to to operate through us in that life like he wishes because we depend on our programs and our stuff and our giveaways and door prizes, all that kind of junk, all this business stuff that has infiltrated the body of Christ. And, and um, what's happened is that faith has been boiled down to this intellectual exercise that I have faith because I know something or because I believe something. Now the word believe in the scripture literally means to be living something out. And the word faith has to do with true dependency on Christ. And when we practice true dependency upon Christ, the deeds that he did when he walked around on the earth, especially from 30 to 33 years old, where it's documented in the gospel so well, those deeds that he did then, he still does those deeds and wants to do those deeds through you and I. True faith, his faith and his father resulted in him doing good things that needed doing, meeting needs that needed to be met. The needs are still there. People are still breathing. People still lack thanks to the fall of man. People who have access to Christ and the body of Christ but aren't taught 
that they can do all things through Christ who is their strength, and that he will supply all their needs according to his riches and glory. Most of us aren't being taught that, so those of us who understand that are able to usher our brothers and sisters into Christ, in Christ into a fuller understanding of the fact that in Christ that we really lack nothing. And many of our brothers and sisters are pining away for stuff and for situations that if they truly needed it, God would supply it. It's a waste of perfectly good eggs. Faith was designed by God to be accompanied by works. Like James said, our works, which are visible to somebody, reveal the presence of our faith, which is invisible. So let's say you go and pick up some trash that's on the ground. Nobody sees you do it, but God is visible. You saw you do it. But your faith, which is invisible, comes visible through what you do. If you go and help somebody or, or, or sidle up to someone and help to meet their need, and you don't broadcast it all over the place, but at least the person whose need you meet knows. And your invisible faith becomes visible to that person. James 2.19 says this, you believe there is one God. Good work. You do well. Even the demons believe and they tremble. Now both the, the New American Standard Bible and the complete Jewish Bible translate that first statement, you believe there is one God, like this. You believe that God is one. And I see that to be an accurate translation and one which supports the truth that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are one. And this coincides with what Jesus said to the Jewish leaders in his prayer to the Father in, in uh, John 10.30. When he says this, I'm pasting stuff so that y'all can see it too. When he says this, I and my Father are one. And when he says this, later, oops, wrong file. <laughs> ah. Um, I used to have somebody that, that would help me and they would paste stuff for me, but they don't do that anymore. So now I'm doing it myself. Um, And for their sakes I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth. He's talking to his father. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me and the glory which you gave me I've given you, that they may be one Jesus and the Father, uh, just as we are one, I and them, and you and me, why? That they may be made perfect in one. That the world may know that you sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. So James, in, in um, James 2.19, you believe that God is one, good for you. The demons believe it too. The thought makes them shudder with fear. James 2.19, the, the complete Jewish Bible. James casually refers to a doctrine which is disputed today, the Trinity, but which was a given in the first century church. You believe that God is one. Good for you. The demons believe it too. So the truth is there are people who don't believe a true doctrine that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are one. But the demons understand it and believe it. Isn't that sad? James continues his point from verses 4 to 18 by addressing an issue that's real in the church today. going to 
paste this in a second. We can easily rephrase the verse this way, uh, verse 19 of uh, James uh, 2. We can easily rephrase it this way and make James's point. Your doctrine, the list of things you believe is perfect. Even Satan's demons believe Christian doctrine and it terrifies them. Now, what are you doing with that perfect doctrine? There are Christian groups today who exist based on their belief that they have nailed down perfectly everything Christian doctrine wise. Every Christian doctrine. Their faith, if you will, is in their own ability to believe, understand, and reason through the Word of God. That's what their faith is in. Not in the Lord. It's in their ability. I have figured this out. And that's why my group is amazing and your group isn't. They actually market themselves using their prideful belief that they understand God fully. What is that sort of faith worth? Well, lucky for us, James will tell them. James 20, 20. I'm sorry, James 2, verse 20. What is that sort of faith worth? But you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is, de- is, is uh, dead? Now, several versions of the Bible translated that last word, dead, differently. The NASB says it's useless. The Amplified Bible and NIV Bible say ineffective, inactive, and worthless. The complete Jewish version of the Bible says faith without works is dead. The Amplified and NIV say faith without works is inactive, ineffective, and worthless. The King James and New King James translate the word correctly as dead. And the Greek word used is nekros, N-E-K-R-O-S, and it refers to a corpse. So what an incredible contrast this is to what God's intentions are for us in Christ. So that kind of faith without works is a corpse. Jesus' intention is this. I have come that they may have life and that they may do it more abundantly. John 10.10. What is the thief's intention? He's come to steal, kill, and destroy. So when faith without works is useless, which of those two is in action? Is it Christ bringing life and more abundant life? Or is it the devil has come and stolen something, killed something, and destroyed something because faith without works is a corpse. We really have to come to grips with the fact that the devil has has wreaked havoc on the body of Christ. And the only way we can get this back, bring the life back, is for one of us, one at a time, to make a decision thus far and no further. I'm not going to let Satan do this to me anymore and begin to seek God and crowd in close to him and, and, and uh, walk in that life. To let the Holy Spirit of God bring that life to us so we can have that life and that abundantly. That's why Jesus uh, went to the cross on our behalf so that we would have that. In another place, Jesus says this. Well, it's at the end of, um, of John. You know, not everything that Jesus did is in the scriptures. Does that sound sacrilegious? Look at how John ends his gospel. And truly, Jesus did many other things in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that you believe that believing you may have life in his name. Now, as I taught the Gospel of John, I came to understand the term believing literally means to be living in. In James 2.20, James says, 
But you want to know a foolish man that faith without works is dead, is a corpse? There's something about putting our faith into action which allows us to experience resurrection life. However, when we believe all the right things and never serve anyone else, we might as well be dead. I want to tell you a story. When I was in a youth scenario, I was a member of a congregation, and um, and we had we had elders in a congregation. Uh, it was a pretty well-to-do group of people. I, almost everybody there worked in oil business. Um, the ministries this group wanted to do was uh, a golf tournament, which was play. They want to do a game night, which is play, and they wanted to have a giveaway pie to um, to visitors night, to where you get you brought a pie to a visitor's house and ate it with them, which is pleasurable. For that, there was no ministry that was difficult. Now, at the time, I was serving, I was working in, in a counseling center in a church, a different congregation. In, in Houston and I was also serving two days a week at the county jail which was definitely not fun it wasn't playing you know it was hot it was smelly it was hard work it was heartbreaking work and I was so frustrated that these guys wanted to have basically another country club in our town I was so frustrated so so what happened was we got word of a group and our splinter of the body of Christ our denomination that um, there was groups of this that were taking turns feeding the homeless in downtown Houston and somehow it got on the radar for these guys and we went now in the congregation there was some youth and one of the youth was a babysitter that we would pay sometimes to watch our sons <laughs> when they were little and this this little girl was perfect I mean her hair was perfect she was anyway everybody shows up everybody's dressed nice I remember she had a bow, like, perfectly placed in her hair. Her hair was curled. She had makeup on. She was, she, she went, we went to downtown Houston, and uh, it was like going um, into the county jail. I mean, we were in an abandoned uh, community center gym. There was no fans. There was no uh, air conditioning. The people came in. They were all smelly. There were street people living under bridges, living on the sidewalks, and we were uh, serving them food as if we were their waiters. And and I was just uh, basically um, uh, making sure the kids were okay and making sure that things got done. And I remember at one point I was standing up against the wall where well, I saw one of the elders, and he was just like terrified. I mean trying to become one with this wall to get as far away from these you know stinky straight people as he could get and uh, I, I'm not going to use his real name uh, whenever I do this um, I always say Bob so um, I walk up <laughs> it was so obvious that he was way out of his element you know and and uh, he was up against the wall and I said hey Bob what do you think and he goes this is horrible this is horrible. They're not thankful. They're not thanking us. They're just taking everything we give them, and they're 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 um, bending, wash their hands. I mean, it was just you know. And along came that little babysitter, whatever. I can't remember her name for anything. And uh, she was like 15 years old. And 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 I, and I stopped her. I said, "Come here. I want I want to talk to you for a second. She comes over, and her eyes was so alive she was so just jacked up with excitement about doing some real stuff really taking care of people her faith was being united with works and the life of Christ was all over her makeup was sweated away her bow was like cockeyed her curls were all gone she had dirt on her clothes and she couldn't have cared less I remember she had a smudge or something on her cheek. She couldn't have cared less. She was so alive. And I said, Bob, look at her face. Look at the life in her face. She is so into this. For the first time in her life, she's doing something selfless for somebody else. 
not expecting anything in return. We never went back. That was the only time we did it because it wasn't cute and it wasn't fun and it infuriated me. Jesus was in that gym. He was in that gym and everybody who opened their hearts up to these people. Jesus uh, apparently was on, on vacation when it came to Bob. Now there are friends of mine that went to that place. They were named Bob. I'm not talking about anybody named Bob. Just, I know the guy's name. I'm just not going to say it. There's something about putting our faith into action which allows us to experience resurrection life. That little girl was experiencing the life that came with the resurrection. We can believe everything perfectly and never serve anyone else. And if we do, we might as well be a corpse. If we can serve. There are people that can't physically or financially or their circumstances won't allow it. So I'm not, I'm not talking to anybody now. In his rebuke, James refers to a Christian. He's a hypothetical. Who doesn't believe works are important. And he refers to him to be a foolish man. And the word foolish means empty and hollow. And I don't like the idea of being in a room full of empty Christians with faith, which is in God's eyes as dead as a corpse. It's a terrible image, isn't it? I mean, I've actually been in bodies where during worship the Lord showed me corpses all over the room. It's a terrible image. Well, that's the state of much of the church today. We expect the organizations to which we've pledged our loyalty to do all the works while we throw tides at them, while we give money. And often that money just goes to keep the building going. It's empty, it's dead, and it's sadness. And it doesn't have to be this way. If what James has written and what I'm teaching touches you, cry out to God. Cry out to God to show you the works He has for you to do. I mean, the scripture promises this. Look what it says in, in one of my favorite verses, Ephesians 2.10. Paul wrote this. We are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we would walk in them. In other words, God has prepared things for you to do that's not for me to do. I've got things God has prepared for me to do. Don't compare your list to mine, and I won't compare my list to you, to your list. There are works prepared beforehand in Christ Jesus for you to do and for nobody else to do. And we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to accomplish those things. It's, it's our heritage. It's part of what we're here for. We're not just here to punch in and out for a couple of hours a week someplace. Whether it be a house congregation or a big worship service someplace or a small intimate building somewhere, it doesn't really matter. We're always walking around with Christ inside of us, 24-7. We don't have office hours. I'm willing to bet that if we pair our faith, our trust in Jesus, with the works he would have us do, we'll never feel the death which permeates the world and which permeates much of the church today which functions just like the world does. And it doesn't bring me any joy to say that kind of stuff. I hate that the church looks like the world. We're supposed to be bringing the church into the world to change the world so other people could join in and be ambassadors for Christ with us. Now next, James reminds his Jewish Christian readers about a couple of high-profile Jewish people in history whose works were valuable 
and which gain them the approval of God. In James 2.21 he says this, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Now remember, these are scattered Jewish Christians away from Jerusalem, strangers in strange lands, wherever they are, they could their stuff needs doing, right? Um, James begins to reference some Old Testament greats to make his point. He says that their ancestor, Abraham, was justified or considered to be righteous and innocent because he offered his son as a sacrifice to God. And I'm going to quote that out of Genesis 22, the first three verses. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that meant kill and burn up his body completely. On one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham went and did it. He arose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Abraham's works had several components. One was that he immediately was obedient and acted on God's command. In Genesis 22, four to five we see this so we're going to look at the various works that Abraham did then on the third day Abraham lifted his eyes saw the place afar off and Abraham said to his young men stay here with the donkey the lad and I will go yonder and worship and we will come back to you another component of his works was that Abraham had faith that God's promise that his inhabitants would come through Isaac would somehow still happen even if he killed his son. Look what he says. We're going to go up yonder and we're going to come back. So he was trying to figure out how all that worked. And this is why telling the young man, this is why his, why telling his young men that they would be back after sacrificing on the mountaintop is a work of faith. Kind of boo boo, I got a mark. So that's the second work of faith. A third work of faith is this. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son and he took the fire in his hand and the knife and the two of them went together but Isaac spoke to Abraham his father and said my father and he said here I am my son and he said look the fire and the wood but where is the lamb for the burnt offering and Abraham said my son God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering so the two went together. A third work of faith is trusting God for provision when it seemed that God was taking his son from him. Abraham trusted him anyway. Then uh, Genesis 22, 9 to 14. Right. You know, I'm quoting a lot out of Genesis here uh, because James referred to it. Um, the people at uh, the Jewish Christians that he was writing to might be familiar with that where some of us might not be. He said in James 22:19, Then it came to a place of which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order, and he bound Isaac his son, an adult man, uh, he bound his adult son up, 
pla and placed the wood in order, and he bound I Isaac his son, laid him on the altar upon the wood. Then Abraham stretched out his hand, took his knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So Abraham said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything for him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked. And there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram, offered it for a burnt sacrifice offering instead of a son. And Abraham named the place, The Lord Will Provide as it is today in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided or Jehovah Yara Jehovah Yara and the fourth work of faith of course was that Abraham was so fully committed to obeying God that he was actually willing to sacrifice Isaac we're going to end in just a second James says do you see that faith was working together with his works and by works, faith was made perfect. James introduces an interesting idea that faith could work together with works to accomplish something amazing. The Greek word translated as working together is synergio, S-U-N-E-R-G-E-O. It literally means co-worker, but it implies that they are to work together for something, to cooperate, to contribute to an end or a goal. Together, works cause faith to be made perfect. The Greek word translated as made perfect is teleohu. It's one of my favorites. And it means to fully accomplish all things intended by God. It's a form of the word Jesus uttered as he died on the cross when he said it is finished. When our Lord said this, he was saying it accomplished everything his Father intended by sending him to the earth. When we link our faith with works, it allows our faith, our trust in the Lord, to become made perfect by God. And in this way, we can participate effectively in accomplishing all things he intended for us. And we're going to pick up again next time at James um, 2, verse 23. So I appreciate you being here today. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you all for coming. We're going to pray. I'm going to post a couple of links. Father, I just thank you so much for this Bible study. I ask you to bless all who view it, even now or on YouTube later, or on Facebook later. We ask that you um, bring us back to these things so that we can we can understand what you had us to study here today so we could be more effective as ambassadors for Christ and communicating the kingdom of heaven to the earth I thank you that you trust us with this I thank you that all this matters to you and I thank you that we matter to you I ask you to bless us in Jesus' name Amen if you go to that link I just posted you'll see um um, that last time uh, the week before last uh, I was ill last time so the week before last um, that Bible study is there on YouTube uh, you can also go to this link there's a whole mess of articles there like 270 I think articles that uh, we can read and um, I think it, um, I'm always going to be learning so, so anyway I thank you for your time thank you for coming I love you guys I'll see you next time. It's time for me to go spend some time with Mrs. Pastor Mike. God bless you. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.